Sometimes, it feels like all we do is complain. In video games, it's pretty common for people to complain about the balance of the game, the balance of a character, but it's not exclusive to gaming. In the world that we live in today, even though for the most part it's incredibly privileged, we still find ways to act like the smallest nuisance and bad thing to happen is the end of the world. This is kind of silly too, because if you think about it, we have roofs over our head, we have food to eat, and water to drink. And unfortunately, that's not the case for everybody else in the world, which is very sad to think about. While we may love the fact that we have amazing cities with incredibly cool buildings, architecture, culture, and history, we should also be planting trees, 20 million to be exact. So maybe, just maybe, even if Yasuo is a stupid and broken champion, it's probably not the worst thing to ever happen in your life if he solo kills you. All jokes aside, Hating on Riot is completely justified at times, don't get me wrong. They do a lot of things that I feel like are incorrect. But when it comes to some of the champions on this list today, I think they've done a pretty good job with them over the last couple of years. These are champions that they've nailed, and I feel like are almost perfect in the way that their kit interacts with the game and exists in League of Legends as a whole. As a final note, of course, this list is subjective to me and my feelings towards the game, but it's also important to note that this is a discussion video and it's supposed to be pretty fun, so if you disagree or want to add something to the list, feel free to let me know. I'd be more than happy to hear what you guys think in the comments down below. Speaking of good design and things that are well made, this video today is powered up by LolWiz. The best way to make sure that you win more games is to use tools that help you improve as a player, and LolWiz is no exception. Trust me, NA players, we need this badly because did you see our world's performance? The nice thing about LolWiz is that it helps you before you even start playing. Over your last 100 ranked games, you can see stats of your best performing champions. And this is nice because unless you're a one trick, it gives you a reminder and an idea that, hey, these are some of my better champions. For me, Yasuo and Kai'Sa have performed surprisingly well for me in my last 100 games, which, well, I guess it shouldn't be a shocker considering I did make a video about how good that champion is. You can also get counter bands to perform even better in champion select, and it's even possible to import high performing runes during champion select with a click of a button. And you know what? It actually supports teamfight tactics too, so if you're into TFT and League of Legends, then there's no better app to use because it's all in one. Go dominate the rift and I'll see you guys out there climbing before the season ends. Use the link below to check out LolWiz. Let's kick off our list with a decently obvious example and a heavy favorite in this category for a very long time. The reason that Anivia has gone mostly unchanged and received literally zero reworks for more than 10 years is because her design is just flat out good. All of her abilities, all the way down to her passive, are almost exactly the same as they were on July 10th, 2009 when she was released, which I don't think any other champion can say that aside from maybe Kennen. She's the perfect mid-range battle mage who scales very well and provides exactly what you need from her. An argument against her could be that she's boring to play, or something like that. But she has very dedicated one-tricks in high elo, and of course one of League's most popular players and streamers of all time, which is Froggen, made a name for himself because of Anivia over the years. She is deceptively skill expressive with Anivia one tricks being extremely impressive on the champ and knowing all of the ins and outs. I'm constantly shown when playing against a good Anivia how strong they can be. The biggest difference for me noticing is not just the use of Q, which I do think matters and you need to be able to hit your stun, but also the use of wall. An Anivia who knows how to use their wall effectively is pretty much a night and day difference between one who doesn't, and that's what makes the champion so exciting for those that do like her. Following Anivia, let's transition into a champion that a lot of people actually hate, which is Thresh. Now, Thresh is the most popular support in the game and is one of, if not the most popular champion of all time. And that's for a reason. He's fun, flashy, has great utility, and is exciting to watch. His kit feels very fluid and smooth to play. I swear, there's just something about hitting that hook, following it, and then flaying them back into your team. On top of that, now he has a very cool lore with Lucian and the brand new champion named Senna. 
He has been a super popular champion ever since his release, and there are some very notable Thresh players. There's a pretty famous term known as Mad Life, which is named after a Korean player who was a Thresh expert. The term Mad Life is essentially someone who just doesn't miss any hooks. And it's not just Mad Life that has been known for his Thresh though. Guys like Bunny Fufu has almost entirely spawned his career because of this champion. Of the most played champs in the game, like Yasuo, Kaisa, Riven, Zed, Darius, and Pike, Thresh, in my opinion, is the most fair. Sure, he's had some stints where he's really oppressive, like when Aftershock was first put into the game and he did have to be nerfed. When he's a good champion, he does crowd out other support options because he has everything that a support wants, but the love that the community has for him can't really be denied here. His kit is so fun that it even inspired Riot to create a game mode out of it, the Dark Star Thresh game mode. This was a really fun and fast expansion game that took the core concepts of his kit, which is hitting the hook and using lanterns, and turned it into an arcade style party game. And not a lot of champions can say that. Let's stay with the bot lane, and let's talk about the champion with the best theme and design that will probably never be matched. The whole number four thing is cool. The mask, the artist, the fact that all types of players love to play Jin. An ADC that is completely different from the rest that doesn't focus on DPS, but rather kiting and mid-range burst, followed by long-range utility and snipes. Jin has the best design in the game, hands down. Everything about this champion makes sense. He is easy to pick up, but super hard to master. He has a lot of skill shots, but he doesn't really feel that hard to play. He has probably one of the most fun ultimates in the entire game, and everything feels so fluid and enjoyable. Riot will probably never be able to outdo themselves with Jin because they totally nailed his design. He has some really cool skins and a really cool lore as well, which does just add more icing to the cake that they did a great job with this champion. Another marksman that we have to include on this list is Jinx. Everything about this champ is fun. From her lore, her personality, and the gameplay itself, there's nothing about the champion that just doesn't scream crazy. Her presence in this game is found everywhere, and from a marketing perspective, she is the star of the show on some of Riot's most creative videos and skin lines. In celebration of Jinx's release, there was a music video that came out called Get Jinxed, and now this is one of the most widely seen League videos with 86 million views. She's also the main character in the Odyssey video in For That skin line, and she was also the first Star Guardian skin to be priced at 1820 RP with all new voice lines. Obviously, everything cannot be based off of skins and presents, but these kinds of things are relevant and a decent indicator that people in general like the champion. Marketability does actually translate to being pretty cool and pretty fun. However, playing Jinx is also fun because of the resets and the late game scaling. You could be useless all game and get put in the dirt in laning phase, but if you finally get a chance to get your items and have one good fight, you can turn the game right around. The fact that she is fairly easy to pick up and play is also cool because she's a great starter champion to learn how to play ADC, and of course the cross map snipes with her ultimate are also pretty fun. She's punishable early, and seems fair enough to play against encounter, but if you let her farm she's a ticking time bomb, literally. I think that Nami is League of Legends most fair champion, and let me clarify what that means. When she's strong, she never really feels unbalanced. If you don't think she's the most fair champion, she's at least the most fair enchanter, I think. She's hardly ever a bad pick in the meta, and you could easily be a Nami one trick as a support main, because she's good in every single team comp for the most part. Her Q is such a fair skill shot. I honestly think maybe it's even too fair. I kind of feel like I want to see some nerfs to her healing in lane, but make the hitbox bigger and make it fly faster on her Q, that way she can easily get multi-person bubbles for wombo combos. Just a thought, but I think it's kind of rare how often she can actually get multi-bubbles. She synergizes very well with aggressive lanes like Draven and Caitlyn, but she can also be used in scaling lanes too, making her a very versatile option for the support player, never really feeling like I'm outclassed just because my champion sucks. She has a plethora of good skins, some that the weebs love and others that normal human beings also like too, and her laugh spam is like the best thing in the entire game.
Now it's time to get into the champion, which I think is the most arguable on my list today. Because if you want to be completely and politically correct, prim and proper, no, I don't think Lee Sin should be here, because he is kind of broken and definitely overloaded. However, this is a video about design, not necessarily about perfect balance, at least to a certain extent. It's just too hard for me not to put the most popular champion of all time on a list of well-designed champions. He is ever-present in League of Legends for competitive play, solo queue smurfing, and iron gameplay. He's just that fun, he is everywhere. He's fast, mobile, technical, and stylish. Just the core concept of hitting Sonic Wave and flying to them is so freaking fun, he was the first champion I ever fell in love with. When I first started playing League of Legends, he was the very first character that I ever ran into, and I was like, wow, wait, that's a cool champion, what the heck? Lee Sin is so cool, what, what's his name? Lee Sin? That's his name? I gotta buy that guy. Even if his balance is not perfect, it doesn't mean that he's not cool as heck. Throughout his many years of tearing up solo queue in pro play, to having a player named Insect changing the game forever because of the champion, there might not be a better representation of League of Legends and what the game has to offer than Lee Sin. For a very long time, Orianna has been popular for all types of players. From LCS pros to auto-filled mid laners and one tricks in high elo, she is a jack of all trades, master of none champion that even when Orianna is too strong and does need to be nerfed, it never really feels that bad to play against her. I will take laning against a very skilled Orianna player when she's strong in the meta, rather than playing against a Talon or Syndra or Zed when they are broken and obliterate you with insane damage. Her ultimate has always been one of the most exciting things in the game, and the wombo combos that people have pulled off over the years are always fun to watch. There just isn't much that can compete with a really good shockwave. Just like his lore states, Shen is pretty balanced. He does damage so that he can be fun and also have agency in the laning phase, but he doesn't do too much damage outside of laning phase either. A very skilled Shen player can show off immense skill by using his R well, but you are punished for not using it correctly because the cooldown is so long, which it should be. Sometimes this champion is 1v9 from either top or support, and the Shen player is impressive as heck with how much impact he has. Other times, he's utterly useless, and it comes down to how good you are at Shen, which is exactly what a champion should do, similar to Bard from earlier. There have been times in earlier seasons that he's had stints of being way too strong when taking teleport wasn't as common, as well as the global meta seen as OP with Karthus, Twisted Fate, and Shen every game. He did have some outdated abilities, but in order to bring new life to the champion a couple years back, Riot updated Shen with new visuals, a new Q ability, and the sword mechanic, as well as having a one-of-a-kind ability that has a dodge zone for utility for Shen and his team and all of his allies that they can't be auto-attacked. This update is probably one of the best that they've ever done. He's a tank that is skill expressive and feels fun to play and exciting and pull off when you get the right ultimate. Continuing on with tanks, one thing about most of them is that they're not typically designed with their skill floor and their skill ceiling in mind. Most of the time, tanks are just pretty easy to play. To be fair, they are usually easy because of the nature of their kits as well. The fact that you take less damage overall is going to make it so your positioning won't be punished as much. It's pretty rare for the Maokai on your team to say, Oh crap guys, sorry, I got picked off, I, I got caught. Very different from the Vayne who constantly gets one shot by everybody. Scion is one of the few tanks that can display a lot of skill. You have your Q, and using it correctly to get the knockup and the extra damage is vital. Landing your E not only for the slow but also for the resistance shred is also important, and cross map drifting with your R is unusual, but when done correctly is game changing. He also has a very fun and cool AD lethality build that a popular streamer does in Challenger in EU named the Baus. Of course, Tiltarella is also known for his Scion gameplay, and he started a YouTube channel because of it. This gives the versatility to either be a full-on carry or a tank depending on the team comp, and he's always been underrated as a support. There is a reason that you have Scion mains like Tiltarella and the Baus, while other tank mains are basically non-existent in the content creator world. He's actually a tank that is kind of fun to watch. There is a famous quote about mid lane, and it comes from none other than the greatest player of all time, 
Faker. Faker believes that every mid laner should be able to play Twisted Fate because if mastered, he teaches you how to look at the minimap. Now, this quote hints at the idea that learning Twisted Fate also in turn helps you learn the basics of the game. TF isn't necessarily the best laner, nor is he the best teamfighter. He is not weak early game, but he's also not super strong. He's not weak late game, but he isn't exactly known for scaling either. The point is, when you play Twisted Fate, you are fundamentally learning how to play the game correctly because your champion forces you to play matchups well, build defensive when you have to, and of course, play the map and look at the minimap. A good Twisted Fate is not just someone that has to be a mechanically profound player, but also somebody that has to be good at their lane and good at the game. Rather than being so blatantly overpowered that he just mashes his buttons into your face and he wins because his champion is just too good right now, instead, even when TF is strong in the meta, you still have to prove that you understand League of Legends and use your lead and map mobility. He is annoying to play against with his ultimate, but he feels more fair than the likes of Talon or Talia when they roam too. I know that he's always going to be a good option for solo queue, but that doesn't really mean he can't be balanced either. There is a reason some of the best players in the world, more specifically Dopa, is known for his Twisted Fate and at one point was basically a Twisted Fate one trick. Being good at TF forces you to be good at the game, and that's pretty cool design. There have been a lot of reworks that turned out terribly. The original Mordekaiser rework in Season 5, the Zack, Sejuani, and Maokai tank reworks which have all turned out bad in their own way. Akali's rework calls into question what balance should be, Aatrox's rework completely removed the champion from being on hit and instead made him play like Riven, and Ryze makes the list at least four times. However, there's one rework that we will easily remember as being the best, which is Warwick. Before he was changed, this is easily the most boring champion ever, and it will never be topped. He was the definition of easy to play. He had two point and click abilities, and two passives and a toggle. He was basically only having two abilities to use, and they were both easy to use. The patch that he was broken on 4.20, he was the easiest champion to ever succeed with because he was so overpowered and so incredibly easy to play. He did have some problems outside of the fact that he was totally outdated and boring, so they reworked him, which they knocked out of the ballpark. His R scaling with his movement speed makes it totally fun to use, and he now has way more options to gank before level 6 because of his E, and you can display some serious skill on the champion with holding your Q to follow the opponent's dashes and escapes. I know that some of you will say that he does have some gameplay problems, because I have heard that he has a couple of bugs with his W and some issues for a while now, and Riot hasn't been fixing them, which is really unfortunate if that is the case, so let me know in the comments. While it does feel really bad, and it sucks that that's the case, even if that's true, he really needs to be on this list because this is the definition of how they should be reworking champions. They modernized the kit, they fixed some gameplay flaws, and they didn't ruin the identity of what the champion is, which they definitely screwed up on with Aatrox, turning him into Riven instead of Trindamir, which is really frustrating. They sold this rework very well with a sweet teaser and a trailer, and made us all pretty hyped for it, which they totally nailed. Finally, we can finish up with not just a champion, but also a message. A message to you, the viewer. Along the same lines of Twisted Fate, as a champion that teaches you something, I think I have to include the most famous scripter champion in the game, which is Xerath. 
Now, let's not get it mixed up. I do not endorse scripts, nor am I telling you that you should be scripting your gameplay. In fact, I'm pretty sure they are a ban on site now. I haven't even heard of anybody dealing with them in such a long time. I think a few seasons back, they've been totally demolished. Anyway, even if they are cheating, which isn't good, I think it proves an interesting point. Because all that a Xeroth script really is, is just a computer playing as if it were a perfect player. We've seen a lot of these computer players and AI in other types of games and media. AlphaGo was a project designed to master the ancient Chinese board game called Go through machine learning. Since this isn't relevant to League, I'll give you a brief explanation of how this works. Learning anything in life requires you to do an action, analyze that action and performance, and then remember that analysis, and then apply it to all future events. Humans, however, have limits. You can spend 100 hours every single week playing League of Legends, you can spend 10 hours every single day playing Xerath, you can play a thousand games of Go every single year, and you can learn from those past experiences and become better and understand more as a result. However, the way machine learning works is that in the case of AlphaGo, these machines start out like idiots, total noobs. They are terrible at the games and the tasks at first. However, because they are learning, they have to take baby steps to learn what is a good move, a bad move, a mistake, a win, or a loss. And it's pretty slow at first. And if you're more interested in the way that this stuff works, I highly recommend checking out the YouTube channel called Code Bullet. This guy is a programmer and he makes very interesting videos about popular games, and he has AI learn how to play them. I believe it's through machine learning. Anyway, even though it's slow at first and the computer is arguably worse at the game than a brand new human would be because they don't have that level of common sense, knowledge, or past experience, it catches up to the humans pretty quickly. A human can only play a thousand games of Go per year and learn from those games, but a computer, well, it can simulate millions of games of Go per day. It can learn, process, and observe faster than any human could ever hope to do. AlphaGo played against the best Go player in the world in China, and it won every single time. In just a couple of weeks of machine learning, it surpassed thousands of years of knowledge, understanding, and strategy that us lowly humans could create. It's so good that it literally cannot lose. For scripting in League of Legends, you will never be able to land all of your abilities and simultaneously dodge every skill shot thrown at you, but you can try. Even if it's for obvious reasons that a computer can outclass you, that does mean that, clearly, you aren't the perfect player, because if you were, you would be a scripter. You can always improve on Xerath, because the champion rewards skill shot accuracy more than any other champion, which is why he is so commonly used for cheaters. The ability to land long range spells while also being safe, and not getting hit by anything, removes Xerath's immobility as a true weakness. This champion is proof, and a reminder, that, you know what, even when you want to blame your team, you could always be better and improve mechanically. You could always be as good as a scripter. Anyway, that's just some motivation, and that's just some food for thought. Let me know what you thought of this list today, and let me know what you thought of this video in the comment section down below. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.